year this has been, huh? Yeah, what a year indeed. You know, I'm really glad that to, to see you all here today because I've got a question for you all. What brought you here today? God. <laughs> These kids are well trained. They know the answer is Jesus or God. <laughs> so, so what brought you here to this church today? Is it a tradition uh, of going to the Christmas Eve service with your family? Is it the wonderful Christmas carols that we sing every year? Is it the candle lighting that we do after communion? Is this your first time and you wanted to see what it would be like? Maybe you're a person that comes to a church at every service the church ever offers. Or, or maybe you're one that never, ever misses a service on Christmas and Easter. Maybe you were wandering in the street and heard the singing. Or maybe you're here to keep the peace. Because somebody said you're going, and that's fine. <laughs> now, there's a lot of reasons why you might be here tonight, but I would like to offer you one more. You are here because of Jesus Christ. You are here because of Jesus Christ. All of the circumstances that brought you here to be sitting in that pew at this time were because of Jesus Christ, because he wanted you here. Now, you may believe everything I'm saying, or you might be skeptical. You may love Jesus with your whole heart, or you may think the whole story of Jesus is fake. But I believe that he has caused you to be here for this moment, for this time, so that he might share a truth with you. Now, before you go running to the car and heading for the hills, do we have hills in Texas? Oh, good Lord. Yeah. We do, yeah, where you live. <laughs> but before you go running, uh, I would like you to open your minds and your hearts to the message today, to allow yourself to hear the words of the message. And, and if you have questions afterwards, I'd love to spend some time to go, uh, with you going through them. But for now, share with me your attention and your heart as we investigate the words of Luke and we discover the circumstances of the birth of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Holy Father, you give us the wonderful privilege to, to celebrate our faith as we see fit in this country. You give us the, the, the ability to boldly proclaim your name with no risk. But God, today, I ask you to open our hearts, to break open our fears, and to let you in, to let your Holy Spirit touch our hearts that we might leave here different better, and that we might be able to share your word with the world. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So when I read scripture, I like sometimes to take some time and look beyond the words, you know, to find the meanings behind what is written. You know, there's a reason for this, and uh, I mean, for instance, if I were to tell you that this morning... I was sawing logs. What would that mean? I was snoring, right? In fact, I was snoring so bad I chased my wife out of the room. That's actually true. <laughs> that was actually true. But yeah, you're, you're right. I, I, if I'm sawing logs, that means I'm sleeping, right? But what if I said a uh, cat's got your tongue? Does that mean your tongue is severed and the cat's playing with it somewhere? No. What does it mean? You're speechless, right? Yeah. You don't have anything to say. You know, these are cliches. This is uh, language that's used to describe uh, the, the different meanings that are semi-related to the subject. We use language like this all the time. We can say a little short sentence or phrase that means certain things to other people based on our social context, right? I didn't have to tell you what sawing logs meant, right? You just knew it because it's a part of our language. But here's the problem. We don't speak Greek 
or Hebrew, and we don't speak it in their social context, right? We don't live according to the customs and the social norms of the ancient world. We have our own language here in the United States. We, we, most of us speak English, right? Not Hebrew or Greek. And then again, we speak American English. You know, there's, there's this couple that I've seen on social media every now and again. They're, they're doing these various uh, different things to entertain people. But, but the wife is from the United States and the, the husband is from Australia. And one of the things they like to do is to compare the names that they have for common items. So I'm not going to go through all the ones that they've done, but it's actually quite entertaining. But let's take automobiles, for example, right? Tomorrow morning you're going to get up, you're probably going to open presents, and some of us are going to be traveling to different locations with presents, right, to, to take to this family or whatever, right? And we're going to put those tra uh, presents in the car, right? Where do we put them? Oh, <laughs> you already knew. Yeah, we put them in the trunk, right? But if you're in Australia, it's called the it's called the boot, right? Let's say your car, let's God forbid, your car breaks down on the way, right? And you lift up the hood here in the United States. What would it be? Do you know? The bonnet. The bonnet. He, man, he's been to Australia, I guess. Okay, you're running behind, right? Because the, the kids took forever getting ready or whatever, right? And so now you're 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 going down I ten to get to uh, to grandma's house or wherever you're going and and here in the United States, you'd be passing cars, right? But in Australia, you'd be overtaking cars. Yeah. And maybe you're going to a venue or something to eat later on, and you go to the parking lot, right? Not in Australia. You know what that one is? Uh-oh. I, I got them stumped. You go to the car park. Yeah, right? You go to the, Not the parking lot. You go to the car park. Of, of course, yeah. <laughs> And you don't put gas in your car, you put petrol in the, in the, uh, in the Australia. And you don't use your blinker. You, no, you use your indicator. Indicator, yeah. But this, was, this is the one, maybe this one's stumpy. This is the one that kind of blew my mind, though. They don't, when you go to Lowe's to pick up lumber, you use your what? Your truck, right? They don't call them trucks in Australia. They call them utes. <laughs> Now, the only thing I can think of is maybe it's short for utility vehicle or something, but yeah, they call them mutes. So why do I bring this up? Why do I bring this up? And what in the world does this have to do with the very well-known story of Joseph and Mary and the birth of Jesus? Well, the one thing that bothered me about this story for a very, very long time was that there was no guest room for Mary and Joseph. There's no place for them to stay. And I always thought that was strange. I mean, I mean that's really strange. And, and here's why. First of all, why would no one let a pregnant woman who's about to go into labor or is in labor have a place to have that baby? I mean, I would argue that if, if a woman was driving down the street and pulled into my driveway and asked for help because she's about to have a baby, I would give her any help that she would need. I would argue that any of you would give you give this woman any help that she needed, right? Towels, water, whatever they needed, right? Call for call nine one one. That's probably the first thing I do. Call nine. Get this woman out of here. No. <laughs> but we don't need to be Christians to know that's the right thing to do, right? But why was Mary and Joseph denied this courtesy? Why were they denied this courtesy in their time of need? She's about, she's having a baby. Why was she denied that? Another consideration is that this is Joseph's hometown. This is his hometown. Wouldn't his relatives have somewhere for him to stay? You know, Joseph and Mary were heading to Bethlehem because of a census that was ordered by Caesar Augustus. They were heading there for a reason. And I would argue that all of his relatives knew that people would be coming, right? Uh, uh, Joseph wouldn't have to send uh, a head to say, hey, I'm coming and I'm bringing Mary, she's pregnant. He wouldn't have to do that because they would already know. So let's assume that he didn't. They would still be making accommodations for all these people coming into town, right? You would think. So why were they turned away? 
You know, looking at this from our social perspective, it doesn't give much validity to the story, does it? It, it just seems strange. If our perspective of the story is similar to the ancient world, then why would they leave it in there? And even better, why would this story have lasted so long? Why was this story added to the canon of holy scriptures if there are these controversies? But then I realized we don't have the same perspectives. Our social context is not the same as the ancient world. We have different social structures. In the ancient world, when a woman had a baby, she would be religiously unclean for two weeks. Anybody that was there to help out with the baby would be religiously unclean. And anybody that, any house that the baby was born in would also be religiously unclean. And this meant that they couldn't go to worship in the synagogue, they couldn't go to the temple, and they couldn't even do just uh, regular uh, religious services like a, a Seder meal or something like that. They couldn't do these things because they were considered religiously unclean. The people in Bethlehem were welcoming to their town relatives that they probably hadn't seen in a while. You know, people that don't just live around Bethlehem. People that live a long ways off. And, you know, Bethlehem's not very far from the temple in Jerusalem. And perhaps some of these people that, that live nearby were planning on going to the worship in the temple. If they were to let Mary in the house to have the baby, then everybody that was there could be denied the ability to go to the temple. Everybody there could have been denied the ability to, to worship in the synagogue. So this explains the birth of Jesus and how it took place and the way it did, but what about Jesus himself? We believe, as United Methodists, that Jesus is God. We believe that Jesus is the incarnate person of God. We believe this for many reasons, but to sum it down for today's sake, only God can forgive sin. And Jesus forgives our sin. But God is all-powerful. If God is all-powerful, then why does he have to become a man to forgive sin? Well, the gift of forgiveness is something that we must accept for ourselves. It's a gift that we need to be willing to receive. Salvation cannot be forced upon us. I mean, if a person falls out of, a, uh, out of a boat or a ship in the middle of the ocean, and they're drowning, right? And somebody throws a lifeline to that person. The drowning person must grab a hold of the rope to be saved. They have to do something. Just because the person throwing the lifeline cannot force salvation on them. They have to be willing to take a hold of it. But why does God need to become a man for salvation to work? Why couldn't he just tell us about it? I mean, why couldn't God just appear right here before us and offer us salvation? Can you imagine that? Can you imagine God just boom right here, big guy right here, and, and he says, come take your salvation. What would you guys do? <laughs> Run? Yeah, that'd be kind of scary, you know? I mean, like in our story today, the, the angels appear. Not God, the angel appeared, and they said, do not be afraid. You know, if we heard the message from God himself, we would probably not walk right up there and take the gift. We'd probably be terrified. You know, a few weeks ago, somebody gave me a script from a very famous person, a script that kind of kind of talks about this conundrum. The, this famous person's name is Paul Harvey. You ever hear of that guy? He's a, 
whether you know him or not, he was a very famous radio personality, and he would he would commonly tell stories, and he would most of the time end his story with the phrase, "Now you know the rest of the story." You can always slow that part down, right? You know, when I was when when I used to work in Pasadena, I'd have to be there at seven, and it was about a forty-five minute drive or so. But I'd always leave like at five forty-five, like an hour and fifteen minutes before I had to be there. Not because I wanted to get to work early, because at 5.50, Paul Harvey came on. And I didn't want to miss my Paul Harvey that morning. Well, somebody had given me this script that, that talks about, about Jesus and why God needed to become a man. And when, when I was, oh, another thing about Paul Harvey, in 2005, he was, uh, because of his radio uh, work and the humanitarian work, he was one of the few people that have been presented with the Presidential Medal of Freedom. This kind of really speaks to him. That's the highest uh, honor a civilian can be uh, can receive from, or can be awarded. But I was looking at the script, and I thought to myself, you know, this would be perfect to read to everybody in the church on Christmas Eve. I thought this this would be perfect, but then I thought better about it. I thought to myself, you know, I, I can't read this. I can't read this to you all. I thought it would be better if you heard it from Paul Harvey himself, to listen to what he has to say. May I direct your attention to a story which was originally published by United Press International by Lewis Castles, a longtime friend of mine and colleague. He and I tried for many years to trace the author of these words we never could and it occurs to me that maybe some things some things are supposed to be written without credit to any particular individual let's see what you think after you hear this Christmas story the Christmas story the way it's usually told the God born a man in a manger and all of that escapes some moderns, mostly, I think, because they seek complex answers to their questions, and this one is so utterly simple. So for the cynics and the skeptics and the unconvinced, I'd like to submit this modern parable. The man I'm talking about was not a Scrooge now. He was a kind, a decent, a mostly good man, generous to his family and upright in his dealings with other men, but he just did not believe in all of that incarnation stuff which the churches proclaim at Christmas time. It just did not make sense. And he was too honest to pretend otherwise. He could not swallow the Jesus story about God coming to earth as a man. He told his wife, I'm truly sorry to distress you, but I'm just not going with you to church this Christmas Eve. He said he'd feel like a hypocrite, that he'd much rather just stay home, but that he would wait up for them. So he stayed and they went to the midnight service. Now, shortly after the family drove away in the car, snow began to fall. He went to the window to watch the flurries getting heavier and heavier. Then he went back to his fireside chair, began to read his newspaper. Minutes later, he was startled by a thudding sound, and then another, then yet another. At first, he thought somebody must be throwing snowballs against the living room window. But when he went to the front door to investigate, he found a flock of birds huddled out there miserably in the snow, they had been caught in the storm in a desperate search for shelter. They had tried to fly through his large landscape window. That was what had been making the sound. Well, he couldn't let those poor creatures just lie there and freeze. So he remembered the barn where his children stabled their pony. That would provide a warm shelter. All he would have to do is direct the birds into that shelter. Quickly, he put on a coat and galoshes, and he tramped through the deepening snow to the barn, and he opened the doors wide, and inside the barn he turned on a light so the birds would know the way in. But the birds did not come in. So he figured that food would entice them. He went back into the house and fetched some breadcrumbs and sprinkled those on the snow making a trail of breadcrumbs to the yellow-lighted, wide-open doorway of the stable. But to his dismay, 
the birds ignored the breadcrumbs. The birds just continued to flop around helplessly in the snow. He tried catching them. He could not. He tried shooing them into the barn by walking around them, waving his arms, but instead they scattered in every direction, every direction except into the warm, lighted barn. And that's when he realized that they were afraid of him. They were afraid of him. To him, he reasoned, I'm a strange, terrifying creature. If only I could think of some way to let them know that they can trust me, that I'm not trying to hurt them but to help them. But how? Any move he made tended to frighten them and confuse them. They just would not follow. They would not be led or shooed because they feared him. And he thought to himself, if only I could be a bird now, if I could be a bird and mingle with them and speak their language and tell them not to be afraid, then I could show them the way to the safe warm barn but I would have to be one of them wouldn't I so they could see and hear and understand at that moment the church bells began to ring the sound reached his ears above the sounds of the wind and he stood there listening to the bells at Deste Fidelis listening to the bells pealing the glad tidings of Christmas and he sank to his knees in the snow Paul Harvey, I hope for you and those you love, this will be a wonderfully Merry Christmas. Every time an angel appears in Scripture, the first thing they tell someone is do not be afraid. God could do anything, but instead, he came to us as a fragile little boy so that he might live among us, so that we would not fear him, so that we might learn about this gift he came to bear. Maybe if you came here today as a skeptic, maybe this message has caused you to reconsider what God has done. Maybe you still don't believe, but now have some questions. My prayer for you is that after tonight, no matter what your faith was, Perhaps God was able to reach just a little part of you. And I pray that you might see his love. Because whether or not you believe in God, whether or not you love God, God loves you. And quite frankly, there is nothing you can do about that. Let us pray. Holy Father, God, we give you thanks today that you came to us that we might be saved to usher us into that safe haven, the shelter of salvation. Lord, we call out to you as we get ready to celebrate Christmas. We call out to you for mercy for the forgiveness of our sins. Though we try, we, we struggle, and we make mistakes, and Lord, we, we give you thanks that you forgive us and that you love us this way. 
love us so much that you would place yourself in our place and take upon our sin. And God, there are people in this world that are struggling. There are people in this world that, that don't know your name and, and are going through troubles. It's been a very hard year. And Lord, we, we called out those names to you now. Holy Father, the, the names that were called out and those that are in our hearts, we lift them up to you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.